All right, we have about 50 minutes of Dialogos between Jonathan and Paul. I hope you enjoy. He's laughing at us. He's laughing at us again, John. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see anybody, I didn't see everybody else laugh this yeah, time. Right. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> I, I think in, in some ways, the big, one of the big stories of this thing that we have going is, I'll use one of the words I like to use, the mutual colonization of each other. We're going to do a dialogos here. And when I think about all of the ways that both of you have impacted my thought and my ideas, you know, it, it's, it's been profound. And over dinner a, a little bit, we talked about the fact that one of the strange additions of YouTube has been that, you know, if, if I were a young university student going to John's class, I'd hear him <laughs> for a number of hours. And if, let's say, I was a young ortho bro going to John, Jonathan's church, I'd be all, I, go to, I had to go to Jonathan Peugeot's church. I'd be all excited. But via YouTube, I mean, I've, you know, 50 hours of awakening from the meaning crisis, many hours of Jonathan, um, your, your conversations with, with how many different people. I've, I've listened to hours and hours and hours of both of you, and it shaped me and shaped my thought. I, I, you're right. I mean, I, I think that I have to kind of step back and realize, because I think that when I started making the videos, in some ways, I'm like, okay, I've got a, a job, right? I'm going to help people understand these symbolic patterns, you know, and we're going to try to re-enchant, you know, help re-enchant the world. Um, but then the surprising, these surprising meetings and these surprising discussions, like, kind of transform my thinking in ways that I didn't expect and that I almost didn't notice until I look back and I'm like, hey, wait a minute, I didn't used to talk about that. You know, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't used to talk about uh, those things. Um, and so that is, it's been exciting. That's really exciting and to see that continue and to realize that I have people, like, I mean, I mean John, I think our discussions, I, 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 you probably do something similar. It's like I run our discussions back in my mind and then I run a, a, a theoretical discussion with you where I'm like, all right, what does he think about, what would he think about this? What would he say to this? And I'm like running and it's, a, it's, a, it's not like I'm trying, it's not like a debate. It's actually like I'm, I've, got a, I've got a model of you that's answering my questions. So then when I see you, I'm like, I wanna test that. I want, I'm like, I'll ask you the questions because I wanna like, is, are you gonna answer what I think you, what I thought you would answer? Um, so, that's, so that's wonderful and, and uh, yeah, it's great. I have, a, I have a question for you, Paul, because that's how I wanna start the discussion. Because yesterday in your talk, um, I could see in the slides that there was some aspect that you wanted to talk about, but because of everything, you, you ended up focusing on other things. So my, my, the question I have is this whole discussion, because I followed you from the beginning that, when you started, and I, re, I remembered when I started seeing that you could understand, for example, the levels. And I, I remember when you're like, okay, this, these levels, that's how, that's how this works. And then this embodiment and then these different aspects, which you probably were already kind of thinking about maybe vaguely, but then started to, to become more concrete. And yesterday, one of the subjects you wanted to talk about was the notion of the body of Christ and its relationship to this question of principality or, or, or distributed cognition, whatever word we want to use. And so I guess my question that I wanted to hear you answer was, how has these discussions that we're having modified your perception or your vision of what that term means in the Bible? I, I remember the second conversation you and I had when we started talking about angels. And I remember you talking and I was like, because I remember first when I, I started making videos, someone said, oh, there's another Christian talking about Jordan Peterson. He's a friend of Peterson. His name is Jonathan Peugeot. I know, okay, I'll look him up. And I start listening to these videos, and it's like, what is he talking about? I, I, I can't figure this out. But I kept listening. And, and so actually, a lot of what's happened in me has been 
a really profound, is it a transformation? It's probably a, a solidification of my imagination with, re, with respect to what we mean by body. Because this is, this is the biblical word, and I'm a Protestant, so this is the language I've always used. But I think I always sort of, it was always way too abstract. And, you know, Tom Holland's book had a pretty big uh, effect on me, too, his book Dominion. Um, I mentioned when I was in, you know, I did this event with him, and I, I said, yeah, I'm living in fear that his publicist is going to, you know, write me a letter and say, you're no longer allowed to use the, the cover of his book on so many of your sermon slides. And, and Tom said, no, she won't. <laughs> so, you know, it, part, of what was, part of what was interesting about doing the talk yesterday, even though I had to really sort of figure it out again, by virtue of trying to connect with John's talk, was both of you have really deeply given me an image of, I'll say it this way, I don't know if it's fair or not, a non-Cartesian imagination of the body of Christ and how non-physical bodies, well, that's not non-physical, it's not even the right word, we don't even have to write the language, spiritual bodies actually work. And and that slide I had about Barfield and Tom Holland, which I was running out of time, so I kind of skipped over it. Owen Barfield has this idea about you know, loss of participation, where you've got this word, it means spirit and wind. You have this loss of participation, and then you have this final participation. You have this movement, and that's very much the movement that has happened again and again through history. And Tom Holland sort of brings that out when he notes all the way back to the Hebrew prophets when they say, the gods of the nation are wood and stone. They're not real gods. Okay. And we serve a living God. Okay. And, and when Jesus says things like, in the Gospel of Mark, again, it's so, it's, I'm so amazed that some of the things that are in the Bible that are so shocking to me, people don't pay any attention to. Jesus basically says, you know, it's not what you put into your mouth that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your heart. I mean, think about saying that to that culture. It's amazing he didn't get stoned, you know, the second day on the job. And so you see this dance of participation and now I've come to see that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the resurrection, because the crucifixion without the resurrection doesn't have the same impact. Lots of people got crucified. The crucifixion and the resurrection changed history in a way that is not sort of theoretical. And your work, John, and your Jonathan, and your work, John, both helped me to see that. And that the church is in fact a body, and it's moved by a spirit. Now it's enormously messy, and as someone who works in the church, I've, I see messes that most of you outside will never see. But body is the only word we have. And, and then the question that I have is does that body, that body certainly has agency, that body certainly responds to things in the world, that body certainly shapes people, whether or not they're in and out of the church, does that body have consciousness? Now that's really hard because we can't agree on that definition, but it seems to me it might, but I don't know what kind of consciousness that is because it's, I don't think it's identical to the kind of consciousness I have, neither, so, you know, that, that's where I'm at. I don't know if that answers your question, but you two have significantly shaped my vision of what spirit and spiritual means in the world in ways that I never anticipated when I started all of this. 
Yeah, and I think what you're saying, I, I get, a, I get. You also kind of, I think the the process that you went through, is one that I saw in people watching the videos or people engaging, and so you kind of brought people along, and so I think in a way, in a, there are some interesting aspects to that, which is that I think you could see the change in you, and then you were guiding people in the change that were like, okay, what's going on? Like, what did Jordan Peterson talk about? What did Jonathan talk about? Or what is John talking about? And what are these things that they're talking about? And as you were, you, so we were a little more, at least I, I, myself, I was a little more coming in with like 10 years of writing. Like I'd just been writing hundreds of articles, thinking about this for a very, very long time. It's like finally this, this door opens, it's like someone says, okay, now speak. It's like, all right, it all comes out. And I think John also has been preparing for so long his class, giving his class, doing his practices, doing that, and so it's like this, so to watch, and you were playing this interesting role where it's like, okay, all right, this and that, and putting it together and bringing it together and also connecting our thought together. And I think it's, a, it's, it's fascinating because in a way, you kind of modeled it for people to kind of go through that, that process. Uh, and, and in a way, you, you also modeled it for, for Christians too. Because there's a way in which at least I, I know that my channel in some ways is almost geared more towards non-Christians. Even though I talk about a lot of Christian stuff, I, every time I'm saying something, it's, you'll see it, right? If you watch me, you'll see I'll say something that is completely like right out of the Bible and I go, okay, let's slow down now because I know I just said a bunch of stuff and now you didn't hear it because you're, you've heard it a hundred times before and now you didn't hear what I said. So now I'm, I'm trying to give millions of examples to help a secular person get it. But you were doing it from also from the Christian perspective where it's like, oh, all right, so if we, see, if we see the world this way, then it enlightens something that you've loved for a long time. And I went, that, I went through that too, but not like it didn't happen to me in public. It could happen to me you know, in discussions with my brother or just in this more hermetic space. So yeah, so that's, I think that's a, it, it's exciting to, to reflect on that. Well, I, I think another piece of this, I mean, when you say you're you're doing this for non-Christians, and we talked on our way back about, oh, people want Jonathan to do movie reviews, and he was, you know, movie things, and he was saying, well, I, I started out doing that because, you know, I didn't think I could talk about Christian things in public, but <laughs> you are doing that now, yeah. and I, I think one of the, I mean, one of the strange, and, and in, in a lot of ways, Jordan got this going with, of all things, a biblical series. I mean, that, it was part of the strangeness of that, that here was a guy, I remember when I first, you know, here was a guy who was rambling about the Bible for two plus hours, full of a movie theater, with people who were paying 30, 40 bucks a pop to listen to him, some of them flying all over the world, that was bringing the Bible and this world into the public space in Canada, and that has continued, and, and again, through you, but some, I mean, one of the most amazing conversations you had was with rationality rules, and they're talking, 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 and I'm just watching this, and I, he doesn't have any idea what, jo what Jonathan is saying, and talk, 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 and then something about the resurrection, and oh, you're not one of those people that believes in the resurrection. I mean, it was just the mic drop moment. And, but it, to me, that showed how these long, these conversations that the West had thought were safely buried oh, yeah. are suddenly coming out again. And they're not coming out sort of in the insular Christian space that especially in America, everybody, okay, the Christians have their stuff over there. There's a lot of them, but as long as they don't get too involved in politics, we won't, we won't get too upset. But involved in a way that exposes the foundations of everything that we have in our world. And I think Jordan did that. I think Tom Holland did that. And I think you've been doing that, and you've been doing it more in effect, not simply a historical thing, in some ways like Jordan and, and especially Tom, but you've basically been saying, no, this still really is the way it is. And, and I think people are shocked to hear that. 
Because again, they pretty much thought Christianity was buried and let's, let's leave it below the ground. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, it's a, but it's also really exciting because it also feels, at least in my impression, it's that, let's say 20 years ago, I started to think the way that I think. But I was alone. I mean, my brother and I were just two people, and we never talked about any of this with anyone ever, because there were no hooks on which to hook the things we were talking about. And we knew that if we would say the things we're saying, it would just sound like gibberish, which to some people it still does. I mean, some people still listen to me, and they're like, gibberish, 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 gibberish. Um, but for sure, one of the things that, and I think that's why I got so excited when I heard Jordan the first time and when I heard him on the radio was, oh, he's setting up the hooks. He's putting them up. There are these hooks there. I can see them. Like, I didn't think this was possible. I didn't think this was going to happen. And like, we had had this insight, my brother and I, a long time ago that, that Darwin could be useful to help people understand quality. And, but it's like it never had the, the drive or the possibility of really talking about it. So here's Jordan's like, Darwin, I mean, he didn't say it that way, but I was listening to him and I'm like, there's Darwin bringing back Plato. It's like, we thought it was possible, but we didn't think it could happen. And it's like, oh, here it is. It's happening in front of our very eyes. So yeah, so it's just, so, so to me it was like after, so then when Jordan kind of opened the door, I guess is the way to see it, he just kind of opened the door. I was like, all right, this is it. Like this is the moment in some ways for myself, like the moment I've been preparing for for 20 years, I was like, I better not, we better not miss this opportunity <laughs> to talk about these things. And, 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 and I'm still surprised sometimes what a lot of people come up to me and they say, they say something like, you know, I I've been listening to you for two years or three years and something like in the first year that I was listening to you, I didn't understand what you were saying. I'm like, you listened to me for a whole year without understanding what I was saying? Like, who are you? That's the weirdest thing ever. Like, why would you do that? Uh, I don't know exactly what it is, you know, uh, I guess some, a little, maybe getting a little bit of insight, but then not enough to totally get it, something like that. Uh, yeah, so it's, a, it's fascinating. Well, I, I think it's partly that sleepwalking. The illustration I used of the woman who, oh, there's no difference between these houses. Which house would you like to live in? She keeps pointing mm. to the one without the flames. Uh, people have been sleepwalking, but you know how you are when you're, in the, when you're sleeping, you can still hear stuff and you know, it's almost, and, and I think people have sort of been sleepwalking towards your channel <laughs> until they sort of wake up. And, and I think part of what made has, has made your work so important is you and your brother didn't sit down and say, okay, how can we make, how can we save the church? How can we make Christianity relevant again? You, I mean, you came to it and said, basically, how can, how can this world make sense? Oh, look, oh, there are clues to this. People have worked this out. I mean, you didn't, you didn't stumble into this because your evangelical father made you read, you know, read your Maximus tonight, Jonathan. Um, none, none of that happened. And, and I think what but, we... But I, it was to save my own, my own life. Like it was, yes. it was, it was like we, it's, so you come to a point where it's like, all right. And my brother had the same moment that I did was like, okay. There are two options here. Either I chuck this out the window and that's it, or I better understand this, you know? And it was like, okay, let's give it all, it's, all we can, let's give it all we can, you know? And, and I, think, I think great, I'm grateful that it turned out the way it did, but it was that crisis moment where it's like, and I understand it and I feel it because I know a lot of people are, had that moment in their life where they're like, okay, well, this makes no sense, chuck it, you know? And, 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 and one of the reasons why I, t I talk is because I know that feeling and I, and I sympathize with it. It's like, I get it, I get it, I understand that sense when you're like 20 years old, and you're going to university and you remember all the things people told you and you're like, okay, this guy, right, this guy dies on a cross because of something my ancestors did and now if I believe that, I go to heaven, I'm sorry. No, man, like, sorry, that just, no, like, that's meaningless. It's completely meaningless. 
Uh, and I get it. So because I had that moment, like, no, I better make sense of this or else seriously, this is not it's not going to work. Uh, but luckily, I think and then uh, coming out of it, he I'm says, like, luckily to a Calvinist. <laughs> <laughs> through the grace of God, <laughs> through divine providence. Uh, I, uh, so, you know, coming out of the other side in a way, uh, Stronger. I have. I told this story for maybe some people have heard it, but there's a moment that I, I, I hold on to. It was when I, I was about 21, and I was still like, I was sh shaky in the sense that I was like, what am I doing with this? And I, there was a. I was living with a guy, and he had he had a, a friend who was really like a prototype of what became today, like the kind of social justice. Like she was an angry, really angry lesbian woman. Uh, but I, I actually had a good rapport with her, and it was interesting. And, what, and she was teaching philosophy at the college, local college. And she, one time she came up to me, and she's like, I have this guy in my class. He grew up Catholic, and uh, he's telling me that it's all nonsense. He wants to chuck it out the window. Like, all this Jesus, Mary stuff is complete nonsense. And, he's, and she looked at me, and she said, I hate to see this. What should I tell him? And I had no answer. Like, I had no answer because she was like, it's all scientifically, it makes no sense. None of it makes sense. It's all, you know, I think I gestured to some creationist thing or whatever. And I it was just an empty gesture. And I hold on to that because it's like, I feel like I'm talking to that lady, you know, all the time. Where it's like, it's like, I wish I could go back and have that moment with her where it's like, you know what? I think I can tell, I can explain it in a way that you'll, that you can understand. Um, yeah. Well, I, and I think this, this element of what's happening around us, people, it's, the people who push back most on my estuary idea tend to be Christians because they say, you haven't built into your estuary idea a clear message or a clear proclamation. And, and that's true, I haven't, and that was on purpose. And part of it is because I, I do believe that, I think Jesus said it well, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. And what's compelling about, I think, what we've been doing is we haven't, we haven't necessarily said, here's the foregone conclusion of where you're going to end up. And I think people know that. And I think people see, even in our conversations, they're still learning. They're still exploring. They're still seeking. And there's, they've found some things that they're sharing with us that we may or may not agree, we may or may not understand. But it seems to be rousing us from our slumber a little bit. And it's it's making the world richer. And in my, you know, to go back to the body of Christ thing, I remember when I, I first started, okay, I'm gonna do this deep dive into Jordan Peterson like I'd done into Tim Keller uh, a decade before. And I was concerned about that because I didn't know where it would lead. And I've got you know, at that time, especially five years ago, I had three kids in college. Um, I've got a career that's based on a certain degree of confessional fidelity. I'm going to speak my mind without much of a filter on the internet. I'm going to talk to randos. They say all kinds of crazy things, yeah. <laughs> this might not end well. That's right. <laughs> and I'm going to talk to Jonathan Peugeot, who I'm just sort of beginning to understand. And I'm going to talk to John Verveke, who seems to have read more Christians than I have, especially the ancient ones, and understands them in a very deep way. Where will this go? And for me, what it has come to is a more tangible understanding of the reality of the body of Christ. And for me also, the, an assurance and, and an understanding of the necessity of the physical resurrection of Christ. 
I didn't anticipate that when I started this journey. But yet, here I am. And so, imagining, and then when I talked to Jonathan and got his story, I mean, so many people are fretting about the deconstruction of many Christians, and I certainly share that. But in many ways, the only way past is through. And I have a degree of confidence that, like G.K. Chesterton said, this faith that the West thought was safely buried, Jesus has a way of coming out of the tomb. He just keeps doing it. And this body certainly is his church, and there certainly are boundaries to it, yet the spirit of Christ has so deeply impacted each of us. And again, body, I mean spirit, all the stuff I talked about last night, that I can now understand when Jordan Peterson sits with Sam Harris, and Sam Harris says he's an atheist, and Jordan says, yeah, I know you think that way, and I, I, I understand what Jordan means. And it is because of the body of Christ. I didn't get the last one there. Why do you, why do you mean it's because of the body of Christ? It's because, okay, so a number of years ago, they found an ossuary in, um, you know, where everybody's always looking for the body of Christ. Well, we're sitting in something that was made by it. And via all of my now commingling with an icon carver, turn my iconoclastic church descendants in their grave, um, the body of Christ is all around us. And it, it's been shaped by, by his spirit. It's, it's in these, you know, this stage looks kind of new, but that floor you are all sitting on, the body of Christ poured their heart and sweat and tears into that floor you're sitting on and into that window, which, well, Protestants, if, if we're, maybe only one picture with Jesus at the door, okay? That's, that's a Baptist thing. So, whereas before all of this, the body of Christ was sort of an abstract theoretical metaphor. And thanks to all of this, when I go to the Netherlands and I talk to this Dutch podcaster and he says, you know, well, what do you think coming to this very secular country? I say, I kind of think America is more secular, even though you've got people in church, you know, making all kinds of noises. Because to me, when I come to Europe, the rocks are crying out because the people aren't. But the body of Christ is there in Europe. And, and even though the Canadian relationship with Christianity has been, you know, different from that of America, this body of Christ is moving through history and it's still plenty powerful and the spirit of Christ is, is, is shaping history as we go. Every generation sort of teeters on the edge wondering, are we gonna make it? Well, that's every generation. And, and we live sort of between the perennial and the apocalyptic and we're always there and so one of the, what a comment that someone made to me recently, was it here? I don't remember, I've been to so many of these things lately. Why is it that C.S., you made it. Oh, I said that, okay. Why is it that C.S. Lewis is loved by the Orthodox and the Catholics and the Evangelicals? And I think it's because he, through all of his reading, had a sense of the body of Christ moving through history. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have both of you to thank for that revived spiritual imagination. Hmm.
I don't know what to say. I'm thinking about what you said. Well, you know, many of you have come and you've thanked me. And I should thank you. Thank you as well. And I should thank you. And I know for, for John, this might be a very strange thing. You know, gosh, I made this Calvinist preacher more Christian. <laughs> but, but he hasn't been embarrassed by that in his quest to um, address the meaning crisis. And, you know, I'm sure I'm thinking about, you know, at some point I'd love to have John and Jonathan come to Sacramento and we'll do something in my, in my little church. And, and I know some people will raise eyebrows at, you're having an icon carver and a non-theist and they're gonna talk in my church? Yeah. And I see that as, again, the movement of Christ through history. And I know that there's a lot of anxiety and despair about the future, artificial general intelligence. Um, Jonathan, more than many, can, can articulate the um, apocalyptic aspect of Christianity and clown world and upside downness and bumpy ride and all those things. But I believe that Christianity is a deeply optimistic faith because of course it ends with the new Jerusalem. And again, I have Jonathan to thank because he helped me. I always knew that the Bible starts in a garden and ends in a city, but I never learned about garments of skin and how technology isn't simply an evil that should be shunned, but the, uh, I'll add Isaiah 60 and the inheritance of the riches of the earth that comes with the, comes with the kings of the nations into Jerusalem and what we see, I believe, happening right now in the midst of all of our anxiety is this process towards the new Jerusalem. And I, I, I see that coming in a much more concrete mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. No, I definitely, I definitely agree. I think, at least for me, a lot of the the recent years, like I've been, like you guys, how can I say this? Like I, I, I've had apocalyptic uh, tendencies for, for a long time. Uh, which, because I've been seeing things fray for a long time. It, it's been happening for a while. So as I noticed, as I watch things fray and I can see the pattern of the fraying, uh, I could understand maybe, I could understand because you see it in the story. It's like, okay, so things fall apart, but there's a remnant, there's a seed, there's an ark, there's something which gets carried across the flood and then the thing, whatever, rises up, there's a resurrection, it starts again, right? That's how it works, that's the story. Like I've known that for a long time. And I could see the frame, but I, I was like, wow, how does this, how does this carry through? Like, how do we see, how do, how does, where does the arc, like, where, what's happening? And so what's been exciting for me in the past years is, is I think I can see the glimmer of it, right? It's like I can, I can perceive, we could say it imagistically, really, as like, I can see the, the glimmer of the resurrection appearing on the horizon. And, uh, and I couldn't see that. I would say five years ago, I couldn't see it. I, I, I was just, it was just uh, like, okay, like this is, we're at the end of Western civilization, sorry, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> something like, at the end of something is what I say sometimes. We're at the end of something and I don't see the way out. Like I don't see, I, it's just dark, right. Um, but now I, I do see, that, and, I, and I see it in, this re-enchantment, re which is actually participating in the breakdowns at the same time, it's weird. So you're noticing this kind of re-enchantment, you're noticing religion flooding back in to the world through all kinds of weird and, and, and idiosyncratic ways. But at the same time, in that, that's what's opened the door for, I think, a more integrated understanding and participation in what Christianity is about. And so I can, I'm like, wow. I can see it 
kind of forming. It's a still like a, like a seed. It's still very small, but it's giving. It's, I definitely have more hope, I think. I, I, on the one hand, I can see things are dire even more clearly than I could. But I also have more hope than I had maybe about five, six years ago. I, I think it's helpful always to remember, and of course you know this so well, that the apocalypse is a revelation. And, you know, again and again and again in pastoral work, I know that, and even in my own life, There's a, there's a strange mystery about the darkest times. And as a Christian, I mean, there was one period of my life where I had to learn. You had to have the question, um, would God be enough? Would Jesus be enough? And that question is put to you in a very real way because you look forward and you say, there is no way. And then he asks you to follow. And you know, one of the one of my most memorable conversations with John was the, uh, I think it was with um, John and JP about water walking. And you know, geez, they see Jesus walking across the lake. And Peter gets a crazy idea. Bid me come, Lord. You know, they're always freaking out about Jesus because he's always doing something that scares them to death. And Jesus says, come. And he takes a step. And he starts. And he looks down. And he cries out. Jesus is like, why did you look down, Peter? Why did you look down? So... For me, you know, when I went, went on my Tim Keller dive, you know, I needed that for other reasons then. But when I went on this dive, you know, talking with randos on the internet, um, journaling vocally in public on YouTube, um, not necessarily a success story for a Christian minister, I would imagine. But um, to imagine that taking the risk to open myself up to these two men and Jordan and all of you because, you know, I put out a calendly slot and up someone would come and they would share their story and I would see parts of myself in that story. And then with having almost no knowledge of the rest of your life to try to, with some authenticity offer you some hope. I mean, that's, that's the body of Christ in the flesh doing the work. So that's the body of Christ. Yeah. I think we're done. I don't know if you have more, but thanks everybody for your attention. <laughs>